Alright, here to do a video on GI function. So we're going to be uh, talking about digestion first. Uh, we'll talk about the nutrient processing and absorption. Uh, and then that will be followed up in subsequent lectures with uh, content on regulation of metabolism, which is largely um, what uh, what, do, what does our body do with the nutrients that we absorb from uh, through digestion? Uh, and again, we can store some of those too, so we'll talk about removing them from storage and util utilizing them as well. But it makes sense to sort of start with the, the nutrient source, processing and absorption, and then move into the general metabolism. Okay, so there's the logic. Um, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of sort of GI anatomy and what the different organs do and what the structures are. Um, we are, uh, and so I'll do that here in, the, in the, one of the first videos. Um, we are obviously multicellular and because of that we're, we're diffusion limited. Um, and so as opposed to some animals that phagocytose, single celled animals that phagocytose their food and digest it internally, we digest our food externally. And what that means is that we basically produce secretions to digest nutrients outside of our cells and li quite literally outside of our bodies um, and then absorb those digested uh, nutrients across an epithelial barrier to be taken up by the bloodstream uh, and or lymph system. And when I say that the GI system is sort of outside the body, what I really mean is that the inside of the GI is continuous with the outside world. So we're just sort of like bringing these nutrients into a space that's continuous with the outside world, secreting into that space to digest those nutrients, and then absorbing them from that space, right? And so we have to sort of examine this sort of like flow through diagram of the GI tract, um, focusing on each of the specific areas, what its function is, and then of course the goal here is to, to get at the hormonal regulation um, of each of those functions and regions. Um, and there is quite a bit of, of hormonal regulation of GI function. Um, a lot of physiologists call the, endo the, uh, sorry, the GI tract the largest endocrine gland, quote unquote, of the body because um, it's, not, it's not a gland per se because the cells are not coalesced into one structure, but it has a lot of endocrine cells um, sort of diffusely dispersed within it. Um, so one of the first things I like to do, um, we all sort of get the idea that the GI tract is essentially a, a nine meter long, 30 foot hollow tube. Um, it's got some associated organs connected through ducts, like the pancreas or the gallbladder. Um, to, that, to that tube, um, but what I wanna do first is sort of assess the anatomy, uh, go over the anatomy of that tube at pretty much any location. Um, at any location, it's going to have four very similar layers, and there are subsets of those layers. And I don't want to get crazy on the anatomy, but if we don't understand the anatomy, we can't really understand the function. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a section of the gut that has sort of the most bells and whistles in terms of the, the structural features of the wall. Um, all areas have the same main four layers. There's one slight difference uh, for the esophagus, which is above the diaphragm. Um, the outer layer is a little bit different. It's got a different name. It's, it's not really all that different, but it's got a different name than um, that outer layer below the diaphragm in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, so anyway, so let's start with, I'm gonna start on the inside of the tube and work my way to the outside of the tube. Um, so the inside is obviously lined with an epithelium, right? Because epithelia, epithelial tissues cover all exposed surfaces uh, of the human body. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the, the inside, like in a cross section. So if we take, a, if we take the small, I'm gonna use the small intestine. If we take a small intestine as a tube, and we turn it and look at the end of it, so we're gonna cut it and look at the end of it, uh, you'll see the opening in the center, which is called the luma, lumen. And it looks 
something like that is a little oblong, maybe. There we go. Right, it's got these sort of invaginations, or invaginations, I guess, and evaginations into the space. This is the lumen. Right, so that's where the gut contents will be, would be. So it's a little blob of food in here. Right? And so this layer would be the epithelium. And, and the, that epithelium is, is part of the first innermost layer called the mucosa. And so I'm going to make it a little thicker. Um, get some... A little bit of body here, so we not just point to a line. Let's move it over here. Right, so the mucosa is epithelium plus um, what's called the lamina propria. Well, the epithelium is a layer of usually columnar cells. The only place it's not, uh, the cells aren't columnar are where uh, it's adapted for sort of protection, right? And uh, the oral cavity is a good example. Uh, that you actually have stratified um, squamous cells there, right? Multiple layers for protection against, you know, coarse food that we eat. Um, everywhere else there, it's a layer of simple columnar Right? Simple meaning one layer, columnar meaning the cells are sort of tall and skinny. Um, and right beneath any epithelium is a layer of connected tissue called areolar, if you recall. That's sort of a, a, a loose connected tissue. Um, epithelia are avascular. There are no blood vessels within that layer of cells. So the lamina propria beneath it has blood vessels, it has lymphatics, it has nerves. Right, And so it's got all the sort of components that are going to be linked to this um, epithelial lining. I'm sort of coloring in a little bit here. I don't want to try and draw the cells, at least not yet. Just get carried away too much detail. Okay. So there is our mucosa. The now just beneath the lamina propria. Um, is a layer of muscle called the muscularis mucosa. So I'm not even gonna try and draw it on here. Um, I guess I could draw it with just as a sort of a thin red line. Hopefully you can pick that out. So that's the muscularis mucosa. Okay. Most people link it with the with the mucosa, right? The mucosa being the broad layer here. So I can actually put that below here. And it's a very very thin layer. Of, it's going to be smooth muscle, obviously, right? Um, and it is its job is to contract. It does not change the shape of the tube. Uh, that's going to be bigger, thicker muscle layer farther out. Um, but what it does is it contracts and sort of like, if you have, you have to kind of blow up a section here, but sort of slosh around the 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 the, the, um, the epithelial layer a little bit, and so it's like micro mixing basically. Um, and what that's doing is helping mix the food contents with the secreted contents that are put into the gut to uh, aid digestion. And so it's sort of like a micro mixing. We're gonna have a bigger macro mixing mechanism here a little in a in a minute. The next layer out is called the submucosa. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I have to go backwards for a second. I'll label that in a second. Um, no, the, I, I didn't point out these big ridges. These big ridges are one of the, and again, we're in a small intestine here, so not all areas will have this, um, these big folds that go into the lumen. And those are called circular folds. This whole, this whole thing. Uh, it's sometimes, sometimes they're called plica, P-L-I-C-A. Uh, but those big circular folds increase the surface area of the tube. In other words, if you were to sort of expand this to get rid of those folds, it would be a bigger circle, right? And so they increase the surface area. 
Well, they're actually, and again, still multicellular, they're actually ridges on the surface of those called villi. Uh, I probably have to move that out a little bit for my layers that are coming up. Right, so that's, those are multicellular layered structures. Uh, and then on the surface of the individual cells, again, so now we're getting down to the point where we've been talking about the individual um, columnar epithelial cells. On the surface of those, again, in the small intestine, we have microvilli. So I'm going to put, you might not even be able to see it because we're getting awfully small here, put a little hair like projections growing off the top of these villi. Uh, all of the cells that form the villi. And so those are microvilli. So one more arrow here. Right, so the microvilli are a cellular, subcellular structure. They're a structure of the membrane of a cell. Villi are formed by many cells that form this, these intermediate sized projections. And then the big folds uh, are the circular folds or pleca. Okay, so we have a three-tiered increase in surface area uh, of the, of the um, GI tract, right? And again, that's important for making sure that we have enough surface area across which to absorb all the nutrients that we're digesting. Um, that way, food doesn't escape uh, through the GI tract without being absorbed. Um, okay, so now back to the layer underneath the... Uh, and I have to color this in. Uh, underneath the mucosa was the submucosa. And so it's this green layer. It's sort of filling in. And I'm not trying to draw the structures of it. I'm just showing you this layer. Right, but it would sort of fill this space under the circular folds. Right, and that was... Um, mucosa, and it is another layer of connective tissue, but now we have, it, and essentially it just has larger blood vessels, larger lymphatics, um, it has a submucosal plexus, which is a, a um, system of nerve fibers, which are going to be tied to, incorporated into this bigger system called the enteric nervous system. So it's a portion of the enteric nervous system. So the sub, within the submucosa, we've got, I, I don't have room to write all this out, but blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves, and the nerves are part of uh, the enteric nervous system, and they're called the submucosal plexus. Okay, and what that's gonna be tied to is we need motility, Screen down here. We need motility of the GI tract. We need the controlled secretions of it. And a big chunk of that, I might have wiped out my circle there, right? But to, uh, to control the, the motility and the secretions of the GI tract, part of that control is neural. And so and part of that neural control is inherent to the GI tract. It's called the enteric nervous system. Okay, and again, so part of the enteric nervous system. Outside of the, so that was layer two. So submucosa is layer two, big layer two, right? Mucosa is layer one, so like submucosa is two, going deeper. Uh, underneath that, we have the layer called muscularis. And the muscularis generally has two layers of muscle in it with another plexus between it um, called the myenteric plexus. Myen, myo means muscle, right? So it's the uh, plexus within the muscle layer. Uh, now there's... In, in this bigger, much thicker muscle layer, remember we had the muscularis mucosa, very thin layer here. Now we've got a big fat layer of muscle. And one layer goes around the pipe, it's called the circular layer, and one layer runs, um, the deeper layer, runs longitudinal to the length of the tube, right? Our tube is going in and out of the board here. And so the longitudinal of our jaw is bundles, right? Sort of like so. Right, 
So these bundles of fibers would be running lengthwise in and out of the board as opposed to the inner circular layer, which is the fibers you're running around it. So if you think about it, the circular layer can constrict the tube this way, and the longitudinal layer can shorten the tube. And the two together uh, help with a mixing of the gut contents. And when that's sort of a randomized action, it's called segmentation. Um, it's not really randomized, but the idea is that it causes mixing locally. It's not causing propagation of food down the pipe. Right? Um, the other more coordinated mechanism that does move food lengthwise down the pipe is called uh, peristalsis. Right? And so the, the muscularis layer is, import, is uh, essential for mixing and propulsion. Right? Mixing is called segmentation. Propulsion down the pipe is called peristalsis. And this is the muscularis. Okay, now between the two layers of the muscularis is, as I said before, the myenteric plexus. So I'm going to just draw it as a sort of a squiggly yellow line here. And it's really the other half of the enteric nervous system, right? We had the submucosal plexus somewhere here. Where do I label it? There we go. Submucosal plexus in the submucosa. We've got the myenteric plexus in the muscularis layer. Let me write that down here. Myenteric plexus. And the two together are linked to the autonomic nervous system, right? We know the autonomic nervous system controls visceral function. This is viscera, right? Uh, control smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, right? So we've got smooth muscle and glands. So we've got our, our autonomic nervous system innervating the, these two divisions of the enteric nervous system, which are linked, by the way, helping to control motility and secretions of the gut. Okay. It can act independently because it has its, uh, like, sort of a, a complete set of neurons. It has sensory neurons, it has interneurons for processing, it has motor neurons for generating the actions. Now that's not to say that the enteric nervous system is independent of the central nervous system, the autonomic division of the central nervous system, but it can do a lot of things on its own. Um, we know that it's not independent because if you get really nervous about something, your stomach gets upset, right? And so CNS affects output of the autonomic nervous system, which can change activity of your gut. So it's obvious that the two are tied together. The, the central nervous system, ANS division, and the enteric nervous system, the two plexuses, plexuses. Okay, the fourth layer, right? That was the third layer, muscularis. The fourth layer is the serosa. And so I'm gonna just draw that as a white line. We'll see why I'm drawing it the way I'm drawing it in a second. Okay. The, the serosa is also known as the visceral peritoneum. This is a serous membrane. You've heard of those before. Serous membrane has two layers, right? It has an inner layer, the visceral layer, and it has an outer layer, the parietal layer. I'm going to squeeze a visceral BP for visceral um, peritoneum. Again, that would be also known as the serosa. B period P period equals the serosa. This layer is called the parietal peritoneum. P period P period. Okay, and so what you have in, so this guy's actually attached to the wall of the, of, the, of the abdominal wall, right? So the inside of the abdominal wall is covered with a parietal peritoneum. Notice they're connected, right? So in other words, you've got 20 plus feet of intestine, more than that, right? Um, they can't really get tangled up because it's suspended by what are called the mesenteries. Right? This connection between the visceral and the parietal layers. So that's the mesenteries. 
Well, the other good news is that you don't have to have blood vessels run down 27 feet of intestine to get to the end of your, you know, your GI tract. They can come in along the way through the embedded within these mesenteries. So the mesenteries aren't just membranes, they're also sandwiching nerve fibers and blood vessels and lymphatics, okay? Which would be coming to and from each segment of the gut. Are you okay with that? So this is the abdominal space, cavity space, which would have peritoneal fluid in it, which reduces the frictions. These things slide past one another easily while you're doing jumping jacks and going for a run or whatever. Uh, the mesenteries keep things from getting tangled up because they're sort of tied to the wall so they, don't, they can't sort of move around too much. Um, and, ah, and what did I not say? The serosa is it's mostly connective tissue, but it's got a layer of, of cells in it, uh, on it, essentially, that are secretory, that produce the, the peritoneal fluid. Um, again, basically acting as a lubricant between the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right. I think we have everything we need regarding the four key layers of the gut. The last thing I want to add, though, is that the, now we can have large uh, glandular structures that are attached to this via ducts. As I said before, like the pancreatic duct has a, I would have to like draw a big channel that opens up into the duodenum and, you know, draw the pancreas out here when I, you know, when we get to that segment, uh, that's called the duodenum. Uh, same, same idea for the gallbladder, which is tied to liver secretions that, that end up in the gut. There are smaller glands that produce secretions that are part of this mucosa. So there are mucus sec secreting glands um, and cells, but there are also, I mean, obviously this is a high turnover epithelium, right? These cells do not last long, um, three to five days maybe before they die and are sloughed off and have to be replaced. So obviously there are stem cells associated with the mucosal epithelium that are replacing cells all the time. But in addition, we kept saying like, oh, well we have all these hormones that control GI function. Where are they coming from? Well, there are, and let me add a variety here. I'm gonna just sort of intersperse some colored dots here. carried away. And I'm only putting them in one spot. I'm not trying to be complete here. Right? But those colored cells that are interspersed with the epithelial cells are what are called enteroendocrine cells. So these are diffusely spread out uh, endocrine cells that produce secretions. And again, their secretions are not intended to go into the lumen. They're not, they're not enzymes. They're hormones. And so their secretions actually go into the tissue toward the capillary bed in the lamina propria. And so the lamina propria, the capillaries in the lamina propria pick up these hormones as stimulated by whatever's happening in the, the, um, this segment of the gut or by the central nervous system, right? You think about food and we could alter the secretion of some of these hormones through neural stimulation as well. Um, but these hormones are secreted into the bloodstream and then they can go everywhere, right? So they can come back to different regions, not just this region of the gut, but other regions of the gut to affect activity. They can go to the accessory gland uh, and, and organ uh, sites associated with the GI tract, like the liver or the pancreas or the gallbladder to elicit actions. They can have actions at the brain, things like satiety, feeling of fullness, um, and it can have effects at a lot of different target tissues uh, on general metabolism. We'll come across one later that affects insulin secretion, right? Sort of preparing the body for the nutrient levels to rise immediately after a meal. Okay, I think we got our intraendocrine cells in there. Again, we're not talking about the specific hormones yet. We'll come to those. Um, we got our layers in. I think we'll call it good on this one and start another.